All right, so uh, take your finger real quick and just kind of poke your neighbor and say this word, change. All right. Some of you don't know your neighbor. That might not have been a good idea. It's a new guy. He's like, what, what's going on? Uh, how many of you like change? Yeah, some of us do. We, we enjoy it. We're like, we don't want to be bored. How many of you despise it? Go ahead. Yeah, there's like, yeah, there's some that are ashamed that won't raise their hand because they're afraid they might get changed. So they're like, no. We have two major changes coming uh, to the church. And one of them, how many of you know Lisa Foster? She's wonderful. Lisa has served in the church for 20 years, and several months ago, we started just having little conversations, and um, I went through this, and so I, I, I kind of, I think I maybe came alongside her and helped her a little bit, because when I was moving from Burt Smith's church in Olympia, Washington, as the youth pastor to go be a senior pastor, I dealt with all kinds of weird just stuff, and I didn't know how to navigate, and, and my pastor came and said, well, maybe the Lord's moving you into a new chapter, and I was like, well, maybe. So he prayed and found the heart of God. And Lisa is not leaving the church. Her husband is, yeah, she's a wonderful lady. She's, I, I love her. And her husband, Vintage, who was in the, uh, uh, the first service sitting in, in the front row, he is still our men's ministry director. But she is changing from a staff position to kind of being home, uh, loving on those kids, and she really feels like the Lord's going to move her into some ministry that might maybe be like a parachurch kind of ministry where we, as her family, can help her go into that, to that place, yeah? We can help her find uh, her next chapter, and we want to be part of blessing her. So <clears throat> June 29th is next. No, it's the last Sunday of June. We're going to pray for her here. We have gifts for her. And then outside, there's going to be a tent with some food and some nibbles, and we want you to go to that tent and see Lisa and hug her and thank you for her for 20 years of serving this church. Amen? <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Now we have another change. Uh, two, two changes coming. Uh, about, well, it'll be July 18th on my birthday that I became the pastor of this church two years ago. That's coming up. And about 10 months ago, the Lord started, kind of the Holy Spirit started doing some weirdness to me in a good way, just jabbing at me in some areas and uh, talking to me about some change. And so I, you know, I, sometimes when the Lord speaks stuff to us, we don't really know how to navigate those waters, and we, we, start, we start feeling things that maybe we shouldn't feel. And I started feeling about a prayer life of our church, the prayer culture of our church. The Lord brought me back to prophetic words from 20 years ago that I received from different people that didn't know each other, that didn't know me, that all talk about a church that the Lord's going to give me that's going to be a place of prayer and worship that I myself will be a, have to be a man of prayer to get this done. And so the Lord started revisiting those things to me. And Jim Stilwell, who runs the East Bay uh, Prayer Furnace, that's been with us almost two years. I mean, we're, we were close. And the, the Lord began to talk to me about some issues that we, we kind of felt like were two churches a little bit. Jim and I met, Amy and Jim and I met, and Tyler and Corey. We probably met eight times in, in those several months. Three-hour meetings talking about what, what is the Lord doing and how, what's the Lord going to do in our prayer culture in our church. And we started to find that there was a mandate on Jim that wasn't so much on me. And what the Lord had asked me to do in the area of prayer was not the same exact thing. And so we began to have conversation. And uh, in light of all these things, I came in here after one of our, probably our sixth meeting, I came in the sanctuary and I said, okay, Lord, what's going on? And the Lord, you know, it's funny when you ask God questions, because he will answer you. And the Lord said this to me, son, you can't hire somebody to carry your mandate. And I went, oh, no. You know that, you know that feeling? That feeling, oh, no. And so I, I said, what do you mean? And, and he said, you know, Jim is his, they're prayer dogs, and, and that's what, you know, I'm trying to be. And, and he said, I've, I've asked you as the pastor of the church to carry a mandate and to carry a mantle for this people to create a church that prays, a praying church, people that are seeking after the Lord. And I said, okay. And he said, you can't hire somebody to do that for you. And so I'm asking you to do it. And it was kind of in that moment that I said, okay, Lord. And so Jim and Amy and I met, and we really came to a conclusion that 
their mandate is to be a regional house of prayer. And so I began to ask the Lord, Lord, give them a building that's detached from a church so that it's kind of neutral ground for pastors. Where, you know, pastors not going to come. Some guys aren't coming to East Bay to pray because they go, that's an East Bay thing. I mean, it's terrible, but that's our human, ungodly kind of weakness of us pastors. And so we begin to pray, and I think the Lord is opening that door, and, and he'll, Jim will come up and talk to you in a minute. So we decided, hey, it's probably good that we are not on the same campus, but we're still doing the same thing. We're still actually in the same uh, calling. It's just going to look different for each of us. And Jim and I are good friends, and we play golf together, and we love each other beyond words, and we're still going to be an encouragement. So uh, Jim's going to come and just share a little bit. Jim, come on up. Welcome, Jim Stilwell. <laughs> Should I act surprised again? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Good morning. Let me clarify one thing. Rick plays golf, and I go wherever his ball is on the course. <laughs> <clears throat> if you ever go with him, that's what you want to do. Uh, we are going to be uh, moving beginning tomorrow morning. We're going to be in Livermore at a, um, a place in Livermore that the Lord's opened up for us. Address? 4659 Las Positas Boulevard, Suite B. Yes. And uh, if you need uh, more information, go to our website. It's all there. But um, I agree 100% with everything that Rick just shared with you. Um, I'm excited about what the Lord's doing with us. I'm excited about what he's doing here at East Bay Foursquare. And I'm standing here today. I brought a little gift here that I want to present Rick and, and really to all of you. But just to say thank you. Um, now, hold on. We, we did this in the, in the, you know, when you have multiple services, you have to act surprised every time. <laughs> See, I did. Right. I thought they got me a bowling ball. And I was like, well, they got me a bowling ball. So just let me take this out because this is really a, a pretty cool thing. I just want to make sure I don't break anything. So here you go. It's, you hold that and I'll put this here. So let me just, uh, most of you recognize this because this is in a, out front when you come into, onto this property and into this building of Jesus washing the feet. And it's wonderful that you have that out there so that when people come in, but from our hearts, East Bay Prayer Furnace, I wanted you to know that we wanted to give this back to you because this is what you've done to us. Really. You've washed our feet. Hmm. You, in, you said, okay, Lord, what, if this is what you're doing, we're going to welcome these people in. And I was telling the first service, I sometimes sit around and calculate the, the amount of hours that we're praying. Now, the Lord doesn't really add the hours up and say, Jim, you did good today. You prayed for two hours or one hour or whatever. He doesn't measure us by that. But what you invited here to, two years ago almost, um, I've got the numbers together. It's like 5,000 hours of prayer. Hmm. And so I said, okay, let's break that down a little bit more. That would be like 200 days of 24-hour prayer on this property. That's awesome. That you welcomed in here to this place. And yeah. again, it's not about the hours. It's about what you, what you said, let's go after this, and how you served us and really washed our feet. We are so blessed to have been received by you and, and uh, your generosity and your kindness. When I stood here about two years ago when we first came in, I, I mentioned this phrase that the Lord Jesus is recovering the sanctuary of the church. Mm -hmm. Meaning that he wants it to be a place of encounter more than just once a week or twice a week for people. He wants it to be a lifestyle. That's right. And that's what drew us together, I believe, Rick and I, when we originally began talking. And so we are so excited for what the Lord has for East Bay Foursquare and for East Bay Prayer Furnace. And we just want to honor you and can't say enough how grateful we are to you. And we will continue to partner with you in prayer. And thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. Thank you. So. So we're going we're gonna to pray, and so here's what I want to say. We did this in the first service. Um, look in my beady little eyes when I say this, because the enemy is a schemer, and he loves to create problems and discord, and you need to hear this. Look in my beady little eyes and Jim's beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> Are they blue? Yeah, they're blue. Uh, there is nothing between relationally between Jim and I that is negative. There has not been sin. 
There has not been even disagreement about doctrinal things. It is literally the Lord saying, Rick, this is what I want you to do. Jim, here's what you're doing. Our friendship is awesome. We will play golf together. We will hang out together. I will call him and encourage him in prayer. He will call me. You'll see him. They'll see me over at the Livermore uh, place hanging out. And so hear me when I say this. There's nothing weird. So don't allow the enemy to start talking. Or if you hear something out on the street, you can say, no, 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 I heard right from Jim and Rick. There's nothing weird. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, he's going to pray for us. Jim's going to pray for us, and we're going to pray for Jim. I know we're not Catholic, but stand up one more time. So, Father, we come before you today. We're so grateful for your presence and for family, for brothers and sisters. And I pray very specifically today for East Bay Foursquare. Yeah. You are the Father of glory, and we ask, according to your word, that you would open up the spirit of revelation, yeah. open up the knowledge of who you are to this people more and more. For every person in this community that's come in here over the last couple of years, they've been here for many years, Lord, I ask that you would take them beyond further than they, what they could ask or think. Yeah. Lord, I thank you for what you have purposed for this congregation and this community of believers, followers of Christ, to impact the city, the region with the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. So, Lord, strengthen them. Mm-hmm. Strengthen them in their walk with you. Unveil the beauty and the personality of Jesus as they go on this journey together. Yeah. Pray for Pastor Rick, Corey, and Tyler, their families, and every person that gives leadership. Lord, we ask that your kingdom would come mm. and that your will would be done in every life. Yeah. Make a name for yourself mm-hmm. through East Bay Foursquare. In the name of Jesus, yeah. amen. And Lord, we pray for the East Bay Prayer Furnace. You cover them, bless them, provide for them. God, I do pray that it would become a place where many pastors will come to just be with Jesus, to sit and pray and to prepare sermons, that it would become a true regional house of prayer. Yeah. God, we ask you, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you that we're not discouraged, that we are encouraged and full of yeah. your spirit and ready to do what you've asked us to God, you're the one who provides, so we're just going to do it. We're going to step out and do what you've asked us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Love you, buddy. You, you can just put that right there if you want. Yeah, I'm going to go sit. Okay. okay. Wait, 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 wait. What are you sitting down for? That was so uncool. That was so uncool. Give somebody a high five and sit down. All right. Well, let's pray again. I know we've only prayed 10 times. We're going to pray some more. Lord, bless the word today. Father, thank you for your presence. May the word of God go forth with power today and change hearts and renew minds. We love you. We bless you. Jesus, come and fill this this room with who you are, this place, in your name. Amen. Amen. Today, we've been in a series called Life, and we talked about success And then we talked about aging. How many of you didn't like the aging one too well? Some of you got a lot out of it. Some of you are not sure yet. Uh, Today we're going to talk about disappointment, dealing with disappointment. In life, you're going to be disappointed. The definition of disappointment, a feeling of sadness or displeasure caused by non-fulfillment of one's hopes and expectations. By show of hands, how many of you have ever been disappointed in your life before? Good. You know, it's Debbie and I were talking, who works on our staff, you know, um, it's interesting that um, when you are born into this world, you are greeted into this world with a slap. Have you ever thought about that? They get you, you know, they bam, bam, bam. I don't know if they do that anymore. They did that in the 60s. It wasn't cool. I still remember it. It was very traumatizing. <laughs> but you're kind of greeted with a slap. And, you, you know, it's like, whoa. And, and in life, disappointment is just something we have to manage. Because you're going to be disappointed. And I, I came up with some stuff. I, I, have you ever had an expectation of an event that wasn't as cool as you thought it was going to be? It didn't live up to its expectations? How many of you have ever rented a hotel room that you found online? And when you got there, it was different. <laughs> Cindy and I got this hotel room one time. And I told her, be careful. They make anything look good on the A beautiful room. It looked amazing. We got there. And... Not only, first of all, I didn't even know if we were at the right hotel because of what it looked like. And I was standing out front going, is this, is this where I'd at, Jess? And I walk in, and it's not good. 
And I say to the lady, hey, um, yeah, this picture on here, where did you take that picture? <laughs> she said, from the resort across the street. We took a picture of ours and threw the palm trees. Like, oh. And then, is my room going to look like this? And she said, no. I said, what do you mean? My ro- what, what are you talking about? My, my room's not going to... She said, that's one remodeled room that we have. And you didn't get it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me tell you something. Thank you for the offer, but we're going to go. And we drove all over looking for a new hotel because I'm a hotel snob. I just wanted to say it. The idea of something is better than the reality of it. You ever had that issue where you're dreaming, 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 and the reality of it is different from when it actually happens? So, how have you ever had a dream job that turned into the nightmare job? You're like, if I can do this, I'm a number 10, it's a number 10, and you get the job and it's a four. When I first got into the ministry, I remember thinking to myself, now I was very young, I remember thinking, I am going to absolutely change the world. I mean, I'm going to help people grow in the love of God and disciple them into the kingdom. This is wonderful. I'm going to help sheep walk with Jesus. And then I you know what I realized? Sheep bite. <laughs> sheep don't want to be helped sometimes. You have these great intentions and, oh, I love you. Come here, little sheepy, sheep, sheep. And the sheep's like, Mwah. and you're all sweet. And then it goes, Mwah. and you go, hey. Hey, what happened? I'm here to love you. I'm here to help you. And then you try to help them again, and you're washing their feet, and they kick you in the teeth, and you're like, well, expectation was here, but the reality of it when I got into it was probably here. How many of you have ever met a famous person and thought, well, that was different? <laughs> Burbank, you know, Tyler and I all came from there, and you'd go to Costco, and you'd see somebody from a movie, and you're like, what happened? <laughs> I mean, the person is, on the movie, they're like, they're strapped with grenades, and, and you see him and you go, You're four foot two? <laughs> Come here a second, let me pick you up. <laughs> You're so cute. I stood by one lady, I won't say her name, but she's famous, and she's in this show where she was like, running around, shooting people, and real, ah. and uh, I, I saw her, and I stood right by her, and I was like, she looked like she was 12 years old, she was this tall, I mean, she was, you know, she had to get up on a little step thing to pay the bill at the place we were at, I was like, this is, this is so weird, I met people that I thought would be sweet that weren't, I met people I thought were cool on TV, and they're jerks, and then I met people that I thought were jerks on TV, and they're really nice. So your expectations kind of get wacky, and then disappointment, let's talk about it. I'm going to give you a few things. Maybe you can relate. You ready? How many of you have ever been disappointed with your spouse? Okay, don't, 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 don't raise your hand. They're sitting next to you. <laughs> Can't do that. The first service was hilarious because I said that, and literally every guy in the place went like this. <laughs> no blinking, no movement, just... And you could see the wife like, you know, just give them. Of course, we're disappointed with our spouses. They're human. They're not God. You ever been disappointed with your children? Yeah, somebody been. Oh, bless the Lord. How about this? A friend lets you down. The job's not so good. Your health. Disappointed with what's what's going down in your body. Disappointed with your pastor. It's okay. <laughs> It's all good. I've never claimed to be Jesus. I'm, I'm going to disappoint you. Uh, I've been disappointed by pastors many times, people I've served with and worked with. And then the Lord just said, well, yeah, but they're not human. I mean, they're, they're, they're not me. They're human. So quit it. Just give them grace. Okay, cool. So give me grace. How many of you are let down by the government? <laughs> we don't even want to touch that one. Let's just leave that alone. People get mad at me. You ever been dis- disappointed by yourself? That's probably the biggest one for me. I'm just disappointed about me. How about this? Have you ever been disappointed with God? Anybody ever been disappointed with God? See, you're afraid. Some people are like, if I say I'm, I'm a disappointed, he's going to think and know I'm disappointed. He's God. He already knows you're disappointed. So go ahead and just say it. 
disappointed. He didn't do what I thought he would do. He didn't do it in his time. He didn't, he didn't, right? He didn't, he wasn't there. Where was he? I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. Disappointment is because we put our affections and our expectations in the wrong place most of the time. We put our expectation on our spouse to be the number one and make us completely happy. Look right here. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. You put your expectation on your children to make you completely happy. They'll make you happy, but not completely happy. Your job will fail you. Your health sometimes has issues. Amen? So when we walk through this life, how do we get through those disappointing moments? How do we navigate when I feel disappointed? And I'm going to kind of weave some stuff today, so you really got to pay attention. Some of you are going to just get this and write it down. Some of you might have to go and listen to it again, because I really want you to catch this. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, if you have your Bibles. God is the only one, by the way, who can keep 100% of his promises all the time. And you go, he is not. I'm disappointed. I've been praying for something for four days, and he hasn't done it yet. Listen, I was talking to the Lord one time about something. I, I, was, I was like, God, I'm disappointed. I've been praying and fasting about this, and nothing has changed. It's been, it's been four days. And he said, okay, how about three years? Let's do this on the three-year plan. What? Yeah, because, I, Rick, I'm, I'm way more involved, and in what's important to me is that you and I have a relationship as you're getting to the promise not just the promise. There was a guy I worked with. His name was Clyde, and he owned a great big entertainment TV place, and I worked for him in high school. And I remember he'd walk up to me. He was from the South. He was really, really a nice man. And he'd pull out this wad of $100 bills with a broccoli thing around it. You go, hey, come here, Rick. Come over here for just a sec. And that's how he talked to me. And I was like, dude, you're in California. Throw a dude in there. Just show you're here. He goes, I want you to go over and get me a taco and a Pepsi down at that little taco stand. Like, you gave me a $100 bill to go get a taco? Do you got a five in there? I mean, it's going to be kind of weird handing the kid 100 bucks. And I thought about it. I thought, man, that guy's like rolling. And I watched his kids over the two years I worked for him. They would come in, and all they wanted was what was right here. Just wanted that money. Hey, Dad, I need uh, $200. And he'd break it out, and they were gone. And I watched the dynamics of the family over a couple of years, and I realized something. Those kids didn't even know their father. They didn't understand what made their father tick. All they wanted was the wad of $100 bills. And so the Lord sometimes delays in his promises so that we get to know him better, so that we understand his heart of love for us. He's not opposed to doing this. He just wants more than just this from you. Amen? Sometimes he delays. That doesn't mean he's not going to come through on his promises. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That should make you smile. Hello? Peace with God. Thank you. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. That's the thing I was just talking about, when we have to contend for the promises. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope of the glory of God. I, I, when I read that, this is what I thought. What is that? What is hope in the glory of God? It's this. You ready? I'm, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna, I just want you to know this isn't arrogance. I'm, I'm getting ready to throw you. I'm going to throw you some diamonds right now that you need to go and grab onto and put it in your pocket and hang onto it. The glory of God is what we have our hope in. Hope does not disappoint. The future glory is this, that someday you and I will stand before the Lord and we will be in heaven with Jesus. Watch this. And nothing of disappointment and discouragement will ever visit you again. Watch this. Listen to this. I wrote this down. I felt like this was from the Lord. The things we face can have temporary effect on us, but they have no future. Your problem that you struggle with, anybody? Have an issue you struggle with over and over? 
that thing that just feels like it hounds you, that temptation, that trouble, those issues with marriage and children, that thing has no future. It will someday be dead, gone, and destroyed. It will not meet us in heaven. So what, Paul, what, what Paul's saying is, you are born again. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. It's a deposit saying, you, this is really going to be real. This is good. You're not hoping in Hare Krishna or Buddha or in a great religious idea. You're hoping in the living God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives in your heart. And someday, you're going to go before him, and every disappointment and failure will be gone and never have a future in your life again. That is awesome future glory that's coming. Now, what is glory? What is glory? Jesus said this. He said that the glory of God was in his, in his life, that he expressed the glory of God wherever Jesus went. Prayer, worship, anointing happened, healing happened. Why? Because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to rock your world here in just a sec in a good way. So if the glory of God is our future hope and it's where we're heading, I want to talk to you about the glory that's here now on us as believers because the kingdom is not yet, but it is. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. What is that saying? It's the Holy Spirit. Some of you need to get this. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. Now watch, when that glory is in our lives and we understand who we are, don't get weird, don't get kooky with this, okay? Don't get kooky. But when you reach out and hug somebody and you touch a life, the presence of God, the life of God, the power of the Holy Spirit is there to touch them and change them. I have a relationship with a bunch of guys at Guitar Center. So don't go there and tell them this story. My son went with me the other day, and I walked in, and a guy, it was like being Cheers. Remember Cheers? Hey, Norm. You know, remember that? And every guy in that place, hey, Rick, shaking my hand, doing this to me. How you doing, guys? Hey, all over the store, new guys came in. Hey, Rick. My son goes, Dad, everyone knows you. Everyone's coming up and talk to you. That's so weird. I said, no, it isn't. I've been building friendships with these guys. I've been giving them equipment. I've been, I come in and grab them. Now, a couple of them are believers. They're good guys. I grab the long-haired, hippie guy that doesn't know the Lord, smells like weed. <laughs> I give him a hug. And, How you doing, man? Good. Hit him on the chest, you know, like cool guys do. <laughs> Something of the life of Jesus is being deposited in them because I am full of the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's not weird and it's not kooky. It is reality that where we go, the anointing of God is in us. The glory of the Father is in us. We just don't know it, and we don't know how to unpack it. Listen, when you're praying for that person you see that's sick, the anointing of God is on you, the glory of God is on you, you're reaching out to pray for him, and the enemy goes, you're not a very good Christian. You don't even do good. You're not the very nice person. You shouldn't even be doing this. You can say, yeah, but here's the difference. I'm saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in me, it's the power of God, and I'm going to pray for that person, and the Holy Spirit's going to show up and touch a life and change a life. The glory of God lives in us. I, I, want, I want you to see something in, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. Moses is talking to the Lord saying, and the Lord's going, hey, your, your people have sinned, they're not doing well, so I'm not going with you into the promise, I'm in the promised land, I'm going to send my angel. And Moses, I love Moses, here's what he says, no glory? Read it. No glory, no deal. I don't want to be just spiritual and angels and talking about those things. God, your angels are great, but what I really want is you. I want your presence in my life. And the Lord's like, okay, that's the deal. And watch what Moses asked him. And he said, Moses, he says, please show me your glory. Watch. Then he, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. So what is the glory of God? all of his goodness. It's everything wonderful about who God is. When you see John said when he was in prison, hey, uh, go ask Jesus if he's the one or should I expect another one? And Jesus didn't just say, hey, yeah, John. No, yeah, I'm the one. He said, go tell John. Demons are cast out. The dead are raised. The gospel is preached to the poor. 
Watch what Jesus was really saying. The kingdom of God is here. My glory. Tell them what's happening. Lives are being changed. The goodness of God. He says, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, uh, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see my face and live. Remember uh, Indiana Jones? Remember when they pulled out the Ark of the Covenant and blah, and the guy went, blah, and his face you know, melted. How many of you remember that scene? Yeah, well, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Probably worse, though. Probably just be done. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see my face and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. There's, there's, there's truth here that I'm going to lay on you that's awesome. And I will cover you with my hand while I pass by, and you will, uh, then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Watch this. Jesus said, a wise man builds his house on the? And Jesus is the? So when we know Jesus Christ and we are born again, watch this, we are standing in a place with God where we can share in his glory. If you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can't share in the inheritance of God because it's not yours. You've never received him. So we're standing on the rock. We're already positioned before God to see glory. And he goes like this. And you go, what does this have to do with disappointment? That's what you're thinking. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Keep the disappointment thing in the back of your head. He says, I'm going to pass by you, Moses. You won't be able to see my face because you'll melt. I'm going to put you in the cleft of this rock. I'm going to put my hand over you. And when I pass by you, you're going to see my back. And I thought, God's amazing. We look at his back and we're on the floor. Going, wow, look at the glory of God. Watch. The glory of God is our inheritance. I'm going to say it one more time. The glory of God in Christ Jesus is we stand on the rock and we get to share in the beauty. By the way, do you know we have a greater advantage than Moses? Did you know Moses has nothing on us? Matter of fact, Moses longed to see what you and I see because Jesus came and died and his blood makes us worthy to stand before God and receive glory and to receive relationship from him. You know where disappointment dies? Disappointment dies in the glory of God, in the perspective of the kingdom, when you and I are before the Lord in prayer and worship, and we're finding out who God is, and the stuff of this world, the tribulations and trials, they start to take a back seat. Why? Because we're seeing and beholding the glory of God. And our disappointment goes, right out the window. Doesn't mean that we can't be honest with God. I told the first service, if you're disappointed with God, tell him you're disappointed. Go ahead and dialogue with him, and he will change your perspective on who he is. Now, hold on to that for a sec, okay? We're just about done. Literally, you guys are going, what? It's quick. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. <coughs> Genesis 16, verse 1. We're going to go back to Sarah. Remember we talked about Sarah last week? She was what? Old, past the age. Could I have pleasure? Here she is before that angel came. And everything really began to, to take shape. They've, they've had the promise of God that they're going to have a son. They've already got the promise. And Sarah comes up with a plan. And her name was Sarai at this point because the Lord hadn't changed her name. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai... Let me say this real quick. Disappointment without God's perspective. Say it one more time. Disappointment without God's perspective always leads to discouragement. And discouragement always leads to hopelessness. And hopelessness always leads to cynical living. And cynical living ends up in anger. That is the process. So what you and I have to do is nip the bud at disappointment so that we don't become cynical old believers. How many just don't want to be a cynical old believer? I don't want to be all, I'm angry for Jesus. He, uh, you know, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Genesis 16, yeah, we're there. 
verse 1. And, now, and Sarai, Abraham's wife, had come uh, or had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Okay. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I uh, shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. They slept together. She got pregnant. Look at verse 4. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. When Sarai saw that her plan worked and this lady was pregnant, she became despised. And Sarai said to Abraham, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and now it's not working out, is what she's saying. By the way, that's kind of some Jerry Springer stuff right there. <laughs> Just a little bit. You read the Old Testament, man. There's, Hollywood's got nothing on. on. There's some stuff that went down in the Old Testament. You're like, what are you doing? And people say, yeah, that's why it's okay to have multiple wives, because they did. And I say, no, no, no. The Bible records the actions of men. You find me one verse where the Bible says the Lord blessed multiple marriages. You won't find it. You find the actions of men and the Lord talking about and, and recording the actions of men and then the outcome of those actions. That's what you find. Just because it's in there doesn't mean you should go do it, right? And so Sarah says, hey, listen, and Abraham says to her, do whatever you want to with her. You jerk. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. Don't do this to this lady. And she runs away, and the Bible says that the Lord comes to her and speaks to her. What are you doing here? Where are you going? By the way, that's a great question when the Lord asks you, where, where are you going? What are you doing? Uh, tell him what you're doing. Tell him where you're going. She says, My, man, this happened. Sarah messed me over, man. She told me to go sleep with her husband. I got pregnant. And the Lord was like, listen, I'm going to take care of you. Watch this. Uh... Verse 11, and the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child and your son, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the, the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. Now, if you look at Ishmael and you track who they are today in the world, in the Middle East, they are a giant pain in the neck. And the Lord, watch this, said that they would be. The problem is when you and I start taking on because of disappointment, we start trying to make ourselves happy and make the promise of God come to reality. Guess what? We start birthing little Ishmaels all around us. And they're biting at our ankles emotionally because we, weren't, we, we saw the promise of God and we said, well, God's taking too long, so I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to force this. I put right here, Sarah stepped, stepped, uh, Sarah stepped in with her plan. She tried to deal with her disappointment, with her ideas of how God would remedy the issue. Have you ever done that before? Or am I the only one? I put here in verse 4, her plan became her pain. She despised what she thought was the solution. In, in the Old Testament, there's another J Jerry Springer moment where this dude starts liking his sister, nasty, and he starts longing for her, and she won't sleep with him, so she pre he pretends that he's sick, tells his servant to go get her to bring him some food, and when she brings him food, she, she lock, he locks the door and he rapes her. And the Bible says that when he was finished, he despised her for the rest of his days. The very thing that sometimes we get so enamored by to think that it's going to be the great fulfiller of our life, actually, that plan becomes our pain, and we end up despising it. We end up despising, saying, man, I, 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 that thing that I thought was going to be hopeful to me, that thing I thought was going to give life to me, has actually become a problem in my life. It's actually become an Ishmael and it won't leave me alone. How many just don't want to do that? When we get discouraged and get disappointed, the thing we have to do is go before the Lord, get the perspective of heaven, the glory of God on it, so we don't try to make little Ishmaels out of our life. Ladies, there's a man that you want, you think is going to be the fulfiller of everything in your life. You are completely wrong. Girls in my youth group, when I was a youth pastor, um, 
they'd come into youth group with this guy. And they're cute little, you know, sophomore, junior in high school. And here comes this dude walking in with them. And I'm like, come here for a second. Come here. How many of you know I was a fun youth pastor? <laughs> come here for a second. Sweetheart, what, who, who is that? That's Jimmy. <laughs> what are you doing with Jimmy? Oh, he's so cute. I know, I just saw Jimmy out in the parking lot smoking weed. Are you sure you want to date Jimmy? What do you mean? He's so great. He's, no, 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 hold on. I didn't say he wasn't great. He needs the Lord. She was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to win him to the Lord. And I said, the Bible says in Proverbs that bad company corrupts good morals. It doesn't say that good company corrupts bad morals and makes them better. Matter of fact, nine times out of ten, they'll drag you down. You won't convert them. They'll convert you. Yeah, but I need him. It's just, I'm, I just want to be happy. I'm like, you're 15. <laughs> be happy. <laughs> I release you. Be happy. <laughs> Find Jesus. Love God. Let God deal with Jimmy. Because Jimmy's probably not the one for you in the first place. He's a little freak. <laughs> Sarah's problem was not with Hagar whom she, who she despised. Sarah's problem was with the Lord. She said it in the first couple of verses, didn't she? She said, the Lord has restrained me from having children. Okay. Here's what my counsel would have been to her. Why has the Lord restrained you from having children? Could it be a timing issue? Yeah, but, but, but it's, it's, it's taken so long. It's taken so long. I got this great plan. I'm going to have my husband sleep with this lady. What? First of all, my wife would never come up with that plan. <laughs> Done. It's not going to happen. Thank God. And she created a nightmare in the world even. The Bible says God said there would never be peace in that land. The Middle East by the way, God has a plan for everything that's going on there. He's doing something. He's working in people's hearts. He's saving people over there. He's touching people. But here's what he said about the Middle East. There will never be peace there, ever, until Jesus comes. Well, the Antichrist will set up, and they'll think it's peace, but it's not peace. Never. So when I hear, well, we're doing a peace treaty, president, right? We're doing a peace treaty. I go like this. It's not going to work. Put the pin down. It's not going to work. Because a lady decided that she wanted to try to get God's promise faster than God wanted to give it to her. And when we do that, we create trouble. My first car I ever bought, my wife's here in the first service, and she was amen in the whole way. We got married. She was 19. I was 21. My dad was an, a, an amazing, brilliant mechanic. Like, he restored old Mustangs. He was amazing. And he just was a no-nonsense kind of guy. When he, went, he ran a big car dealership for years, he was the head guy. And he was just, he was a great, like, no-nonsense kind of dude. And uh, we went and bought a car with him one time. My mom wanted this one car, and my dad said, okay, come here, little man. Come here, little salesman. This is what I'm, you're going to give me for my car, and this is what I'm going to pay for your car. And the guy goes, well, let me go to my manager. He goes, if you come back with a different number, I'm going home. And the guy came back with a different number. My dad didn't even say bye. He just put his keys in his pocket, and he walked out, leaving me and my mom sitting there, and he drove home and had dinner. And I said to the dude, I said to the dude, listen, he's serious. If you want to sell us a car, that's got to be the deal, because he ain't coming back. So he called him like an hour and a half later. Okay, Mr. Fry, it's amazing. We worked it out. We can do it. And my dad was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. My first car I was buying, I called my dad, and I said, dad, come to the dealership. I, I, I want you to see this car. And, Look at the, the deal. My dad walks in. Hey, hi to everybody. Nice man. Sits down, grabs the loan, looks at it, puts it down, looks at me and says, I would never do that. I said, oh, thank you, Dad, for coming. Awesome. He gets up and walks out. And I go, let's do it. Let's sign it up. Let's go. And me and Cindy signed on the line. Oh, we got our carts. We're going to be so happy. 
How many know when you get a car, you're happy for about four weeks, then that payment comes and you're not happy anymore? Like, it's a car, you go, it goes, you put the brake on, it stops, and you go there, right? And I literally thought about three years into that loan, I remember having the moment where I said, I should have listened to my dad. That's his business for crying out loud, Rick. Are you new? And then I heard this voice come back that said, yeah, you're new. You didn't know what you were doing. Listen, we so want to go buy that thing, get that thing, date that person, have that job, have that thing. I just so want it. And then we're disappointed, and then we end up discouraged, and that discouragement leads to, 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 to hopelessness, and then that hopelessness leads to I'll settle for anything, and then you start doing stuff you shouldn't do, and <laughs> Ishmael's are being birthed out of your life all over the place. That was gross. I'm sorry. And then, <laughs> and, then, and, and, then, and then you end up angry at the end of your life. And the Lord says, you know how to deal with disappointment? Walk in my glory. Stay before me. Because I have a big wad of $100 bills I want to give you. But I want you to have more than just the $100 bills. I want you to have me. My face. Relationship. Amen? Amen. You know how you deal with disappointment? You don't do what Sarah did. You almost do what Hagar did. She talked to the Lord about it. The Lord said, what are you doing? Where are you going? She had a conversation with God, and that lifted off of her, and she had strength to go back and do what she needed to do. She walked with God in that moment. Glory and his perspective on our disappointments is how we make it through this life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you're so good to us. I'm so thankful that even when we do the dumb things, we make the bad decisions, we, you're so good. You even sometimes smash those little Ishmaels and you, you take care of them. I'm so thankful for that. I pray for every person here, God, right now that your presence would come upon them, that there are young people in this room that need to know Jesus today, that need to walk with God. And I pray that you would open up their hearts to see who you really are that they would love Jesus and understand the love of Jesus. 